don't like sitting down <laughs> tables. So I'll just sit here. A um, few years ago, I was in a panel with uh, Becky Williams, who's a Nobel Peace Laureate from Northern Ireland. And she told an amazing story. She said that she brought some kids to study together, Catholic and Protestant kids, because she thought one of the biggest problems that the country had is the segregation of kids being together. And so she brought them together. They getting to know each other. But the stereotypes were so powerful. So she started thinking, what can I do to change that stereotype? And eventually she thought, what if I bring them somebody out of this area, somebody who's very different, who will open their minds to, to the new world, to that it's not all about Catholics and Protestants. So she brought them a Buddhist monk. And the Buddhist monk came, did his conversation with the kids, and it went very well. And after he left, she asked the kids, so what did you think about it? The kids were like, yeah, he was cool, he was weird, he's this, he's that. And then one of the kids said, I just have one question. Is this Buddhist monk a Catholic or a Protestant? <laughs> and when I think about people coming together from extreme point of views, extremists, I think about this story because our stereotypes of the other, and our worldview is often so limited that we cannot understand those who sit on the other side. And that's how I grew up. I grew up here. I grew up pretty much on 100% on the Palestinian side. My brother was killed when I was 10 years old. Um, I grew up very hardcore Fatah activist uh, where I didn't know anything of the other side. And as I traveled and worked in other conflicts, um, I only picked conflicts that are worse than here. I worked in Afghanistan and in Syria. <laughs> I found this to be true in everywhere uh, I worked in. And so, trying to figure out what to do, one of the things I did is I actually visited Gary in Ireland, in Northern Ireland, see, be careful, yeah. in Northern Ireland uh, a few years ago, because I was working on one of my projects is trying to figure out a way to bring those narratives together, to get people to understand the narrative of the other, to open our minds a little bit more, but also to get people to start working together a lot more. Uh, and I did that through a couple of projects. I'll mention them briefly that I think are relevant to what Gary was talking about. One is a project called I'm Your Protector. It's a project that started with a Jewish friend of mine who's in the States that was looking at the stories and the images we keep hearing. We, have, we are bombarded by images and stories and noise from media and so on that telling us always that the other is the enemy. And we thought, what if we can filter those stories and try to look for patterns that change that narrative a little bit. What if we look at stories like the Holocaust, for example, where if you go to the Holocaust Memorial here in Jerusalem, the only thing you will hear about Palestinians there is the one guy who did support Nazis. What if we look for something a bit different? And we started doing that, and we found that there were hundreds that we could find easily, hundreds of stories of Muslims who protected Jews in the Holocaust. We said, OK, let's take these stories and make them the mainstream. And we started making exhibits with these stories. Stories like uh, an imam in Paris who was forging letters to Jews in the city to say they were uh, Muslims so they wouldn't be shipped to concentration camps. Stories like an Iranian diplomat who argued that Jews were white and therefore should not be killed. And it's believed that about 2,000 people were saved because of him. And we, the King of Morocco as well. There are so many. The country of Albania, which is, uh, I believe, the only place where the number of Jews increased after World War II in Europe. And you take these stories and make them the, the major, the mainstream story to change the narrative. And we start, we say, let's test it in different places. Well, where do we have a large number of people who would be Holocaust deniers, for example, who would be on the extreme side? We, we thought, let's go to Pakistan. That would be an interesting test. And when we had people coming in, pretty much everybody was not interested first in the topic, and two, didn't believe that the Holocaust even happened. 95% of people walked out had a change of opinion. It's incredible. 95% is something you don't get with anything. And the reason they did wasn't because they suddenly just decided to become compassionate but they realized they were at the different side of this equation, that they were the heroes of the story, that it was Muslims who were not the bad ones here, but 
If you're going to deny it, you're going to deny your heroism as well. We start doing the same thing in the other side. We looked at stories like in Bosnia, for example, where people like Jacob Finzi, who hid Muslims in the synagogue in Sarajevo, and we start bringing these stories to Jews and to Muslims here in, well, here, there in the States is where we started, and we're looking at bringing these stories at the moment here. And the amount of changes it's making among the attitudes of people who are even on the extreme side is incredible because you are changing the narrative. So that's one project. The other one, I thought, what if we make this a larger project? What if we want to make it more sustainable? And this was part of our conversation because one of the areas that I think Northern Ireland had to deal with is economics. What if we take economics and narratives and put them together? And we did that through tourism. So I started a company called Mejdi Tours, co-owned with a Jewish friend of mine. Um, not many businesses are co-owned, 50-50 Palestinian and Jewish person. And we thought that in itself changes the paradigm. But also the model we created was challenging the narrative. So instead of having one tour guide on a trip, we decided what if we have two? One Israeli and one Palestinian co-leading trips together. And instead of having a um, couple of speakers, what if we have many different opinions and many different speakers that are representing parts that we might even disagree with? What would happen if that's the trip that people are going through? And it's been fascinating to see it here because even today, I, I came from a settlement where we took our group, and I was thinking the only Palestinians some of these settlers we got to meet today have ever met really face to face in a conversation is it through this trip. The only time these extreme elements have sat down at the same table to talk to a Palestinian is it through this tour. And I've been to places where the only time the Palestinian speaker have ever met an Israeli has, has been through this tour. But the fact of being able to stand together, whether it's like today we did in a settlement or in a refugee camp or in any place we go to and be able to say our different narratives and argue it and try to come to a place where we find some common ground through our narratives is making people think about what is this place about? How can we then move on? What makes, where's the points of differences in our opinion and what, how can we bring them together? And our goal is if we can bring enough people through these kind of trips and if we can get more and more tour guides and companies and businesses to use their place to bring people together and to change the paradigm and change um, the way we think about the conflict, then that would create a difference. Um, we started here, but we're actually doing it now in Northern Ireland. We're doing it in Egypt. We're doing it in Turkey. We're doing it in the Balkans. Uh, and it's incredible to see how many people are also looking for that, how many people are hungry for it. We're actually now looking to do it in Washington, D.C. Anybody can guess what the two conflicts there? Um, gun control. Gun control, no. Um, well, one of them. But we're looking at the blue and red because the more narratives become different and the less we hear from the other side, it's, it's incredible. And even in my research, I'm looking not only on Jewish Palestinian, Israeli Palestinian narratives, I mean, things like crusades, for example, which I grew up as a Palestinian learning how terrible the crusades were. And they were. <laughs> but, but things I learned just recently that made me think, wow, this is different than what my school told me. Uh, that the word in Arabic for crusade, Salibiyin, is only 200 years old. We, it didn't exist before that. We called them by who they were. Meaning if they came from France, if they came from England, that's how we call them. That actually crusade wars weren't just against Muslims. They were against other Christians, they were against pagans, they were against so many others. That wasn't a Christian war against the Muslims. And that changed my understanding of what happened here. Things like the conquering of Constantinople by Muhammad al fatih which I heard always Christian friends of mine say, oh, this is the Muslim war against the Christians, and finding out that his main allies were all Christian, and that there were Muslims fighting on the Christian side too, and it had nothing to do with Islam or Christianity. And these are the narratives that I think we need to counter if we are to bring people from extreme sides together. Thank you. Thank you, Aziz. Come on, please.